Hello and welcome to our webinar, Building a Business Creation Engine. I'm Paul Michaelman, Editor-in-Chief of MIT Sloan Management Review, and I'll be your moderator today. This event will be recorded and will be available approximately three to four business days after the conclusion of the event. Today's slides will also be made available. We welcome your questions for our speakers today. To submit questions, please enter them in the chat box in the lower corner of your screen, or you can submit questions via Twitter using the hashtag MITSMR event. We'll get to as many questions as we possibly can. If you're having any audio difficulties using your computer, you can also call in by telephone or check the help link in the upper portion of your console. Our speakers today are Clayton M. Christensen, Kim B. Clark, Professor of Business Administration at Harvard Business School, and Derek Van Beaver, Senior Lecturer in Business Administration at Harvard Business School and Director of the Forum for Growth and Innovation. Our thanks go out to, MI, uh, to Harvard Business School Executive Education for their sponsorship of this webinar. And now on to our presentation. Over to you, Clay and Derek. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, uh, this is Derek Van Beaver. I have uh, Clay Christensen here to my left. Um, and we're uh, dialing in to you today from a very rainy HBS campus. So if you're not in Cambridge, count yourselves lucky. Um, we are missing one of our co-authors this morning, Tom Bartman. Uh, he's a 2014 uh, graduate of our MBA program here. He was a senior associate with the Forum for Growth and Innovation, which is the research program Clay and I run here at the school. He is at McKinsey now, which has him fully occupied. Um, but he was the lead investigator on this research, and we feel his absence and wish him well. We regard him as having defected to McKinsey. <laughs> exactly. Um, so our plan, I I'm going to assume many of your listeners have read our article, or should, um, but just to get us all on the same page, we want to take the first 15 or 20 minutes of this hour to provide a little necessary context uh, we'll then turn it back to Paul to tee up your questions and comments. And uh, this is a rare opportunity to have informal time with Clay, so we want to make sure that we give you all lots of time to engage with him. So uh, I'll uh, press on at sort of FedEx speed through this presentation. You see the roadmap here. First, I'll cover some background on this challenge of business model innovation, and then describe what we're calling the business model journey. This is an image that we've found very helpful in thinking about uh, business model innovation and what separates winners from losers. And then third, we'll review some promising directions in what uh, we have referred to as the business creation engine. Um, so to get underway, Tom started this research project the way that all good research projects should start, and that is with a terrific question. Why do the world's best companies fail so often when trying to create new businesses with unique business models. Um, some of the stories on this page are familiar. Why was Blockbuster unable to respond to Netflix? Why did Google fail in its attempts to build a social network? Why was GM unable to sustain the Saturn division? Why uh, HP couldn't make its Helion cloud initiative go? Uh, maybe those of you on this webinar have had similar disappointments. This is a very frustrating area, and it is certainly center of the desk for the CEO. Uh, the challenge here comes up in many of the CEO surveys that we reviewed out there. This survey of U.S. CEOs by PwC tells a very familiar tale. About two-thirds of CEOs are concerned about the threat posed by new market entrants to their organization, and yet uh, they themselves plan such moves out of their own markets in the next three years from the survey date. The problem is this challenge is beating even the best of us. So uh, interesting finding from a BCG survey of its, of its population of most innovation, innovative companies, almost all have attempted some form of business model innovation, 94%. But we are just not very good at this. A quarter of us now are actively pursuing such innovations. So what is going on here? Uh, it's easy to see kind of what's not causing the problem. The organizations that we've talked about are rich in resources, smart people, analytics, uh, motivation. And yet from industry to industry and around the world, this problem of failed innovation continues. And the conventional wisdom here, as often, is not terribly helpful. You know, there's tons of well-meaning advice out there. 
So, you know, innovate close to the core. You know, proximity to your core matters to success. Um, hire for ambidexterity or create ambidextrous business units. Uh, don't stray beyond close adjacencies. And, of course, never become a conglomerate. This is all, you know, reasonable advice. These are reasonable cautions or stop signs. But the problem is that none of these prescriptions explains all of the anomalies that occur. When companies are successful at innovating away from their core business, as Amazon and Microsoft have been, for example. So maybe we restate the question as, why are some companies able to create new growth businesses? And from where we sit, I can tell you this is our kind of problem. Uh, in our course here at HBS, which we call uh, Building and Sustaining a Successful Enterprise, or BSSE in HBS shorthand, we teach our students to pay attention to anomalies like these that we've just seen, to develop better theories of what causes what to happen and why. Uh, at the bottom of the slide, one of Clay's characteristic quotes that we essentially engrave over the doorway of the classroom, it's as true here as it was for the theory of disruption. When the business world encounters an intractable management problem, it's a sign that there isn't yet a satisfactory theory for what's causing that problem and under what circumstances it can be overcome. During his time with us, Tom led an intensive study effort that had two components. First, a deep dive on 26 cases of attempted business model innovation that we could identify in the large company population, coding each of these along 20 dimensions to understand what separated winners from losers. Second, we brought nine industry-leading companies struggling with this challenge to campus to share uh, their own experiences with each other and to review and improve our findings. And as the title of our article suggests, we did learn some hard truths about business model innovation along the way. Two that stand out are, first, uh, business models are less flexible and become more rigid over time than we would like to believe. This isn't um, you know, good or bad, it just is, and it's an important reality to understand. And then second, it's not the attributes of the innovator that principally drive success or failure, but rather the nature of the innovation being attempted. So as important as it might be to have a great reputation for innovation or to be guided by ambidextrous leadership to innovate near or far from the core, what's really significant is that you need to understand how the priorities of the innovation you're attempting relate to your existing business model. I'm going to go into that in a little more depth in a second, but that's the key question. A couple of frameworks from our course will be helpful here. First is our business model framework, which we explain in the article. One of the most basic factors complicating uh, our understanding of business model innovation is that we don't have a common language or common framework for understanding what a business model is. And at HBS, we do not help with this problem. It seems like every course here has a favored framework. So the entrepreneurial management course has that framework you see on the left. Uh, the digital innovation um, faculty have this value creation, value capture model they favor. Uh, our strategy course has that pyramidal shaped model that you see. Um, uh, candidly, we do too. We have our own model. And not surprisingly, we happen to like ours better. Uh, but let me explain why. So when we study business models, we prefer this four-box framework, which builds our understanding of the model across four concrete areas. First, the customer value proposition, what we call their job to be done. Second, the resources involved in the model, things, cash, people, IP, tangible assets. Third, processes, the ways in which the organization deploys those resources, the activities that it needs to be great at. And then finally, the profit formula, the way in which the organization generates revenue and profit and utilizes its, its assets. How do we make money in the way that we're structured to make money? Now, when we depict this model, we indicate the interdependence of all of these elements by connecting them with bi-directional arrows. In other words, to build a great model, you need to connect the dots among these four elements. And those connections tighten across time. They become harder to change. Ironically, the more successful you are, the harder it is to change your model. 
And once you understand the model, you can see that there are really two kinds of elements to it. Priorities, ours and the customers, and capabilities. So on the left, what we're trying to accomplish and how, using the capabilities on the right. Now focusing in on that customer value proposition, we teach our students to express the value proposition using that phrase I mentioned a moment ago, as a job to be done. This is not an original observation with us. Famously, Ted Levitt instructed all of us a generation ago that people don't want to buy a quarter inch drill, they want a quarter inch hole. But we encourage our students to analyze their customers not by segment or geography or demographics, but by the job. What's the progress that the customer is trying to make in his or her life? So what are its functional, emotional, and social attributes? Um, what would it feel and be like to have that job fulfilled perfectly? What experiences must we provide? And then how do we integrate to provide those experiences? How do we deploy our capabilities to provide those experiences? This is enormously important because a trap that we can fall into with business model innovation is to focus on a value proposition that is meaningful to us rather than putting, giving pride of place to what is the progress our customers are trying to make. Can I just add one, one thing to that? We really haven't articulated this in a clear enough way, but um, there are lots of interdependencies in the organization that makes it hard to just innovate in and of itself because of the interdependencies. And one of the biggest interdependencies is the way we teach our students to think about marginal versus full cost. Mm. And um, when uh, we teach them that rather than look at full cost, we should look at the sunk and fixed costs and put them aside and just look at the marginal cost and marginal revenue associated with what you're trying to pull off. And uh, when you think about how we should only look at the marginal costs, it causes you to utilize what you have already. Because it, on a marginal cost basis, it makes just in perfect sense to do that. And that makes it really hard to create something that's new because of that, that teaching. Yeah. And I'm not sure that we've figured out how to teach that principle. But we could talk about it later if it's in. No. no, I know it's, I mean, I mentioned that we brought those organizations together. Um, we were presenting uh, the business model framework and one of the uh, executives from those companies I mentioned uh, raised his hand and said, just to clarify, uh, is the value proposition that you're talking about the customer's value proposition or ours? Yeah. And so that right. marginal cost trap or marginal cost thinking, yeah. I absolutely see how it sets in. That's right. So these two theories that we teach in our course around how to um, analyze and then compare business models and then understand the distance that you're asking, the, the nature of the change you're trying to make and the distance you're trying to travel. Um, and then also the job to be done, um, which is an enormously important way to try to understand the progress your customers are trying to make. So to that journey image, you know, I mentioned, we mentioned that business models harden. Uh, interestingly, they harden in a predictable way. They follow a predictable path or journey. And it's really a one-way journey. Um, for this reason, it is not as easy to redeploy resources as we might think, that marginal cost trap Clay is talking about, or to load new priorities onto an existing business. You can spot this most easily in the performance metrics that we honor at each stage along the journey, which prevent us essentially from doubling back along the route. Uh, it's so certain, this journey, that um, you know, we have this map wallpaper here. We're tempted to show you a map of the journey um, as we think about how business models develop. So um, this slide suggests that every successful business, if you are able to run the course, to stay the course, evolves along three discrete stages from market creation 
to sustaining innovation, to efficiency innovation. Let me quickly go through each of those. So first, um, the moment of creation, the market creating innovation. This is the moment, of course, when um, the entrepreneur is obsessed with trying to understand um, what is the job to be done? What is the offering I could put into the world that would cause customers to um, flock to me? At the beginning, if you think about our four box model, there are really two elements that are forming up there. The job to be done and the resource set that the entrepreneur brings with him or her to try to develop that early, early model. Uh, classic picture of Larry and Sergey, right? Entrepreneurship is the dominant tendency. We look back on these humble beginnings stories, sometimes with a shudder, sometimes with fondness. But it's really important to remember that um, what's swirling around the entrepreneurs in this very free floating early stage environment is data about the context of the job. That's what we're immersed in, trying to understand the progress our customer seeks to make or our uh, prospective customer seeks to make. It's a language of questions, not answers. Uh, these activities are, this is the time when we are observing the world as purely as we possibly can. And uh, in some ways, uh, it is the most open we'll ever be in our history. Clay, you, yeah. you love to talk about this moment before we build walls around ourselves. Yeah, yeah, that's right. In, in fact, um, the very first time you launch your product, you just did it. And then if you were successful and you want to launch version two, almost always the organization will have created groups of people who had responsibility for a particular piece of the system. And then what happens is um, the people who have responsibility for these components have to integrate with each other. And so the way that you integrate together, how you define yourselves, how you work with each other, is defined by the product that you're making. And then very quickly what causes the causal mechanism flips. And what the organization can and cannot do is determined by these pathways by which we have integrated in the past. Mm -hmm. And so we, uh, we almost are, just, our capabilities are, are just fixed because the causal mechanism for innovation is in the organization, not in the context of the product itself. Mm -hmm. this, this notion that um, that founding moment, and I don't want to sound mystical about this, but the magic of that founding moment that is such an extroverted hour where, where all we're focused on is um, what would we have to do to earn that first sale? That, that's a moment that is very hard to keep alive or replicate as companies go on about the building the interdependencies that Clay was talking about. Um, and of course, um, characteristically, classically, as we move then to sustaining innovation, now to defending the uh, turf that we've cleared, the hurdles that the business faces change, the uh, skill sets and um, uh, definition, role definition, uh, and people, that we, the professional management that we need to scale the organization, that changes. Uh, and importantly, to improve performance, we change out, we swap out those uh, resources that were kind of informally knit together and develop processes to align more and more tightly to overcome the challenges that we're facing and achieve better performance. So now we develop constructs. Now we exist in an industry. We have competitors. We have share of a market. You know, Clay describes this as kind of, it's like we're building brick walls around ourselves to limit our ability now to innovate, to create new business because we're so preoccupied with defending what we've built. And, and you could almost say that as that happens in a very natural, almost a, 
demand, it, it has to be done this way. Little by little, the worst place, the worst place in the world in which you can create a new business model is within the old business model. It just, to hope to be, that it not be so, is irrelevant. It's, that's the way it works. And therefore, if you really want to innovate and have this event happen, you need to create the context in which it will occur. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and here's a kicker. When you're in this sustaining innovation phase, the metrics that we honor um, always beat the metrics of the prior phase. So the metrics now of market share and of revenue growth and of um, sustaining innovation, you know, incremental improvement always beats from a risk perspective uh, the metrics of trying to discover a new job. You know, it's always preferable from a risk management perspective to focus on the metrics now that we've led ourselves into. The natural conclusion of this journey is the move to efficiency innovation, where in a sense we shift from focusing on the income statement to focusing on the balance sheet and the absolute primacy of capital efficiency and all of the moves around um, downsizing, outsourcing, unintentionally political these days, but uh, a very natural tendency in an established business. In a way, um, it is the destiny of a business to get to the efficiency innovation stage if it survives. And the manager's job now becomes not you know, discovering new jobs in the world, not growing um, the franchise, but really delivering the numbers, delivering the bottom line performance. I had a, asked a student a couple of years ago, to, I said to the whole group, have any of you, before you came to HBS, had a position where you reported directly to a general manager. And there were a couple who actually had. And, and to them, I asked them, well, think about from the, man the general manager's perspective, what proportion of her time was she spent actually doing work versus finding the numbers? And one said about 70% of the time was spent finding the numbers. The other said 95% of the time. And so we'd have a meeting every week on Monday morning. And we'd ask the CFO, um, what are the numbers looking like? And she would respond something like, we need 2% more in gross margins. And so the manager then looked around the room and said, who can give us 2% more gross margins? And that was what the business was about. And then the manager would spend her time following through. Are the numbers going to be there? And uh, I asked the, the woman, uh, has this affected what you want to do professionally? And she said, in a minute, I would not become a general manager because life is too short to generate margins. That is um, it's a disturbing and, and uh, recognizable story. Here, here we are in earnings season, right? And uh, on the slide, the metrics of efficiency innovation, the pursuit of that 2% um, margin shortfall that becomes so all-consuming always beat the metrics of sustaining innovation. Uh, if you don't believe us, ask your CFO. Um, at the conclusion of the journey, uh, investors demand a return of their capital. Uh, investors uh, allocate that capital to new businesses. But here's the problem. The economy is not working terribly well uh, in this regard these days. And truly, investors aren't much better than corporations at creating new businesses. And, and yet, we've talked ourselves into this notion that we should be returning this money back to the markets when it is we who um, have at an event, at a point in time, created this journey and need to figure out how do we make a process out of the event of business model creation? How do we replicate 
this journey rather than trying to double back or somehow change the direction of the businesses that we've created. Just a couple more slides. In our article, we talked about five approaches that we have been studying in partnership with um, some uh, terrific companies that have uh, really uh, intently focused on this with us. First, and this is this is almost uh, you know it's, this is very. Clay has a, a phrase called "idiot simple," and uh, and this is such a, an important basic first step. You can spot obviously future growth gaps that you're going to be facing by essentially um, placing these three point stages uh, on a whiteboard on the wall. So market creating innovation, sustaining innovation, efficiency innovation, and then placing your current businesses, populating that whiteboard with each of your current businesses and try to spot, do we, are we placing enough bets? Are we generating, creating enough new businesses to replace now, to come behind the businesses that are on uh, later stages of the journey? Second, um, start new businesses by exploring the job to be done for the customer. I should have put that, we should have put that on the slide. The job to be done for the customer, not for us. Third, run with potential disruptors of your business rather than being surprised. Put yourself in harm's way and kind of uh, essentially uh, place yourself in that ecosystem rather than uh, looking at it um, from a distance. Fourth, resist the urge to force new businesses to find homes in existing units. And then finally, Use M&A, uh, as a number of, of you are, to create this internal business model uh, disruption and renewal. Some of the companies, uh, some of the organizations we've been learning from and with, uh, EMC uh, had a marvelous federation structure that it used to build its own internal ecosystem uh, inside the company. And uh, Joe Tucci has been very uh, kind in sharing with us his thoughts on that. Uh, we talk in the article about Daimler's uh, creation of the Car to Go franchise, which was um, uh, the first really differentiated challenge to Zipcar's primacy in this market. Uh, Athena Health and its more disruption, please. Uh, Amazon Web Services as a remarkable um, case study in innovation. Um, the, the team from Carolina's Healthcare came here and took our course actually, and have been working with our material. And I uh, just wanted to say, just I think this is our last slide. If you're interested in what you uh, learned about in our article, three things you can do uh, as just you know, uh, easy follow-ons. First, we do offer a course now, a version of our course, through the executive education um, arm of HBS. So once a year, we can be in a disruptive innovation course, um, which Clay chairs and which our teaching group um, staffs uh, as well. Um, second, uh, you may have read uh, some reviews of Clay's or read uh, Clay's uh, most in-depth treatment to date of the theory of jobs to be done, his book Competing Against Luck, published uh, late last year. And then third, um, uh, Clay's first article on business models um, in collaboration with the consulting firm he uh, co-founded, Innosight, uh, came out in the December 2008 issue of Harvard Business Review. I think that was the first time you talked about yeah. the four-box framework. Um, in a general interest uh, setting, and it's a great uh, foundational piece. Uh, with that, let me just leave you with a closing thought. We've been looking at this problem uh, for a long time and trying to understand it uh, in a number of contexts, and we deeply believe what's on this slide. So over the long term, the greatest innovation risk a company can take is to decide not to create new businesses that decouple the company's future from that of its current business units. Uh, so this, this process of renewal through uh, the creation of um, a business model engine, a new business engine, uh, we're deeply committed to and um, are trying to uh, study and would love to study with anyone uh, on the call who's really focused on this challenge. Can I just add one other thing? Yeah. Thanks. Um, it disturbs us, I think, as we study these problems, that um, so many consultants and academics study this problem and say, well, this is what the successful companies do. If we do it the same way, we'll be successful too. And, 
and then they do it that way and they're not successful and so they just and and if you go back in the history of man's attempts to learn how to fly it wasn't clear at the beginning whether man could fly or not and so they did best practices research and they found that gosh there are some people what the entities that fly and almost all of them have wings and feathers and there are a few anomalies like ostriches have wings and feathers and can't and bats have wings and no feathers and they do quite well and uh, uh, squir squirrels can get by you know but the pattern is pretty clear and so the way the innovators tried to learn how to fly was they fabricated wings and bulked up and strapped them on and went up into cathedral sp st spires and jumped off and flapped really hard and it never worked. And for centuries the way they framed the problem was well those idiots just didn't bulk up enough or they didn't have good de wing designs, you know. But they kept killing themselves. And then uh, Daniel Bernoulli figured out, no, you know, there's actually a causal mechanism behind this, and we call this, um, uh, I had my stroke and I can't remember, um, the, this, the, this, airfoil. the airfoil, I'm sorry. There's, there's a concept called an airfoil, and if you create it that looks like this, and then you ran uh, air across it, it pushes it up. And once they understood what caused it to happen, then, oh my gosh, mankind could actually fly quite well. But um, understanding the causal mechanism behind that phenomenon was so critical. And what I think we is frustrating for all of us is too often Innovators try to say, well, we ought to do it the way they did it. Mm -hmm. With ever, without going back to the core, well, what caused them to be successful? Or what caused them not to be successful? And, and, and utilize those insights about causality. And, and we find that actually you can be quite successful. But it, it means that we have to go back to the original mechanism. Mm -hmm. Well, Paul and, and all of you, that's what we um, tried to do in this article, to go back and, and try to dig underneath all of this experience, this success and, and failure, to try to understand um, what does cause success here and under what circumstances have we seen companies able to uh, create and sustain um, uh, innovations in their businesses and to uh, build, um, if not a perfectly repeatable process, uh, at least to attempt to repopulate uh, their inventory of businesses with new businesses to set forth along their respective journeys. So with that, we would love to, uh, Paul, take your questions or the questions of uh, our viewers. Well, thank you very much, Derek and Clay. Um, that was terrific. And you won't be surprised to learn that the questions have been coming in fast and furious. And so we'll, we'll dig right in, but a quick reminder, um, you can use the chat box on the bottom of your screen to submit questions, or you can submit them on Twitter with the hashtag MITSMR event. So let's dig right in. Um, I'm kind of culling as they're flying in, so folks, bear with me. Um, but I'd like to start with a question about the relationship between business model innovation and business model management as an ongoing capability and focus. Do some firms um, take their existing business models for granted as they focus on innovation and then fail during the course of trying to innovate. So can you frame the question again? Sure. I, the, the question is really um, about the, the, the risk of taking your present business model for granted um, as you focus on business model innovation. And if you've seen cases where people have taken their eyes off the prize. I'll, I'll tell you. Um, uh, a case that we have looked at in our course is the case of um, the vacation rental business HomeAway. Um, so we use that um, case study 
uh, as practice for our students to uh, understand how to identify and then build a profile of the business model of a business. And Home Away is actually a, a wonderfully um, pure example of a, a very carefully curated um, set of vacation properties that where the, the relationship, the profit formula, if you will, <clears throat> is a subscription model, which tends to reinforce the exclusivity of the inventory of properties. And um, the management team of home, home Waste recently been bought by Expedia, and they're very attracted by the Airbnb model of the commission-based model. So it's a really interesting question. If you've built this, this kind of gem of a company uh, with a profit formula that has a certain set of incentives for owners and renters, um, could you look at the incredible growth that Airbnb has experienced and say, gee, uh, maybe we could adopt that new model inside our company. It, it would cause you to tend to take your existing model and what you've created for granted in the pursuit of growth. And yet there are some elements in that original model that, taking our argument um, in uh, consideration, that link integrate very, very tightly with each other. And so it's harder to change that than you might wish. Yeah. You know, if I go back to a, a slide that you had, that there are four factors that, or, that define what an organization can and cannot do. And so we have a value proposition. Then we have resources, processes, and a profit formula. And the resources that you, we have are things that can be bought and sold, hired and fired, built and, and, and torn down. But they're, they're assets. And then you have processes. And processes define how you define the, put the, the resources together. And processes are not assets in the sense that they don't exist until you've used the resources in a predictable way over and over again. Mm -hmm. And so you can then have resources that can do what they can do. And then you have processes that can do what they are designed to do. But if you ask this system to uh, do something else, you can then go to the resources and say, I wonder if the resources that we use in building that business, we could use in building this business. Yeah. Could the processes that coalesced over time as we use the resources over and over again to get thing, repetitive things done. Can we ask those resources, those processes, to do this one too? And very often, the answer, if you're, is no. And it's not that they're bad processes. It's just processes are developed to do the same thing over and over again. And so when we ask ourselves, is our organization capable of doing this innovation? The answer is, do our resources, can they do that? Yeah, most of the time, yeah. Can our processes do that? Darn it. We just haven't done this before. And so we may try to do it, but we can't uh, confuse ourselves that we're capable yeah. of doing it because we've never done it. And, and Paul, it, it almost, the, the, the reverse of your question, sometimes we so fall in love with our distinctive resources that we say, gee, that, you know, as Clay suggests, we, we could deploy these elsewhere against a new job. And, uh, you know, sure, we could try, but we're now, the logic is inside out, not outside in, not market back, but rather capability forward. And so the resources appear to be able to be used in that way, but it's not a capability that we've exercised before, and it's not something that the market is an urgent problem the market is bringing to us. That is very common. Yeah. Well, so but let's stay on that point for a moment, because I've gotten some other questions about the relationship between capabilities and the value proposition. Um, 
the Derek, you, 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 you pointed out two issues. One is market focus, but one seems more like a, a question of faith in your capabilities and your belief or lack thereof that a capability can be deployed in a new way. So can we, I mean, can we explore this a little bit more? I think the question I'm asking is, can one effectively focus on a prospective value proposition um, before one has the, that before one really understands what their capabilities are capable of? How much of a leap of faith, you know, can, can, a, can a responsible executive take? Oh, I, I think you've answered your own question, okay? And so go back to the, the four boxes there. What's the value proposition we hope to offer? Resources, processes, profit formula. And we don't want to say, are we good at innovation or can we be, can we be successful at innovation? We have to ask the question, what are we capable of? And divide them into these four buckets. So, do our resources, are they capable of doing this job? And, uh, and then our processes that have developed over time to do the same thing better and better, are, they, are those processes able to do it? And uh, Edgar Schein, who was at, unfortunately was at MIT, um, showed that, that processes only exist that in response to uh, um, challenges that uh, occur over and over again. And then we have a profit formula. This is how we make money in the way we're structured to make money. Is that profit formula capable of going after this new uh, challenge? And I think just uh, taking apart the question of can we be successful into these four buckets tells us what we're good at and what we can do. And if we're not able to do it, that is great news because we can then become capable. We need processes, so we better, you know, um, it, what, what is fallacy is to hope that we are capable of doing it, work our guts out and realize all we have is resources, but we don't have processes or profit formula. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there are a number of questions that have come in about the human element. Um, so you, um, I, I, I'm paraphrasing, um, but you, you, um, you know that it's not the attributes of the innovator that principally drive the success or failure um, in business model innovation, but rather the nature of the innovation being attempted. But that, that would, on its surface, that appears to discount the human element. So surely not everyone is, is cut out for the challenges um, of business model innovation. So can you help us discern when the human element, human element may in fact be a, a factor, especially in failure? Well, let me, uh, let me have a, my uh, hack at it. Um, I don't mean to be on the same page, but can I go back to those four boxes? And uh, what becomes the, when the human element becomes debilitating is when you have a person who is a resource to work in an organization who have processes, and those processes were not designed to do the challenge that the manager asked that person to do. And if you ask that person to work in an organization that cannot succeed because of its processes, that's when a human element becomes very frustrating. You know? And occasionally, you succeed by taking somebody who is a champion and ask the champion, could you help us out here? And the champion can then go through and try to push down the raw processes so that the resources can be successful. But the very fact that they need a champion means that the processes and the profit formula actually can't do the job. And, and therefore, you know, we, we do workarounds. But um, I think that the human element 
if we can harness, the, if, we, if we have good processes that are designed to do the right thing in the situation we're challenging, you know, if, if, we're, if we're succeed at that, then the human element is, it has a different problem, and that is everybody wants to innovate because our organization can actually be good at it. You know, Paul, I mean, I'm thinking back to um, the conversations that we've had with that, that gang of nine companies we've been learning with, and one thing that has really come out in, in, in so many ways, and those of your listeners who are involved uh, in, say, leading a uh, business model innovation effort inside their companies will, will recognize what, what I'm about to say. Um, the reason that we, one of the reasons that we argue for the separation of these activities is that it is so common for the core business to regard the new inno the innovation as a threat, you know, as, as an, an internal enemy, if you will. So, so let me get this straight. I'm, I'm generating income that we're going to give to you, and you're going to use that to start a new business that's going to one day take privacy over my business. And that makes sense to me why. That um, very human failing, that, that very logical from our perspective uh, view, uh, is something that needs to be managed very carefully so that uh, while that, to some extent, that um, rivalry is is unavoidable. Uh, it can also be placed in context by a great leader and and managed uh, on both sides. But that is a human failing, if you will, that uh, we see come up over and over and over again in this terrain. And I'd be curious if your if your if our uh, viewers or listeners um, have experienced that in their own efforts. Well, I, I, you know, the, my sense is based on some of the themes I'm seeing and the questions that they have. So I'm going to try to um, tie what you both just said to, to two other themes that have come in quite strongly. One is how to deal with failure, how to deal with overcoming failure um, in the pursuit of, of, um, of innovation. And the other that are the challenges around measurement. When, particularly with a larger organization, particularly with an organization that doesn't have a strong, um, uh, strong and well-known process for innovation, um, it's, it's easy for the mature part of the organization to impose traditional measurements. And so when you, when you think about the challenges of measuring progress and the inevitability that failure will be more common in the new than it is in the present, um, my sense is that there, that is a broad struggle among our listeners. And if you could speak to those challenges, I think that would be very helpful. I've got responses, but Clay, I know, I'm, sure, I'm sure you do too. Well, um, the biggest insight I have is that if, if innovation is hard for you guys, what you should do is quit your job and become a professor of business at a place like MIT or Harvard. Um, and things will go just great for you. <laughs> because in our profession, we just have to talk. And you guys have to do stuff. So that's my input. Um, I, I have a few others, if, but you go ahead. Um, two, uh, two things. First of all, uh, both of those questions, if those are coming in in volume from your listeners, we're talking with the right crowd. Because those are the questions that we deal with all the time with our students. And um, if, if you're not able to um, place, if, if, if you're not able to um, look at failure and say, what did we learn from this and how do we build, how, let's not make those mistakes again, but if we're making mistakes, we're pushing the envelope in the right way. Um, you know, I, I hate to invoke the, the, um, the image of, you know, a, 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 S session meeting at Amazon again, but the idea that um, we learn from failure and then move on from failure is, is of course essential to innovation. And then second, the issue of metrics is a real, um, this is an area that we're very focused on trying to understand better. Hard metrics drive out soft metrics as we've discussed in um, uh, this uh, webinar. And if you can focus the organization on the job to be done, so how important, how, in, how important to this 
customer, this prospective customer group, is this unfulfilled job? And um, how urgently do they seek a resolution to, a, a, an answer to that job? Um, th those are the metrics that innovators have at those earliest stages, and they're never going to carry the same weight as the reports we're putting together for the earnings call, but that's, again, why that activity needs to be separate in the organization and not combined. It's, uh, yeah, it's a frustrating thing. I'm not, I'm not, of, of all of the problems, the most intractable problem is that a CEO seems incapable of using two different metrics for two different businesses. The CEO on top wants one, one metric that we can, by which we can uh, assess success or failure across all of their businesses. That's just the drive to do. And instead, what we need to understand to do is I will manage this business unit by gross margin percent. And I'm going to measure this business by gross uh, by um, market market share you know and we ought to have different metrics in different situations and yet our CEOs want to use the same thing for every and and that's actually a key problem with innovation is right on the CEO's door thank you Another theme that's emerged in a few questions is um, um, is whether or not the principles that you're describing and the recommendations you are making cross enterprise types, so particularly nonprofits, government organizations. Um, at a high level, do you, does your research suggest that these are equally applicable, or are there differences? Are you uh, when you're saying that, Paul? Are you sitting in? Uh building operated by MIT? I am indeed. Yes. And we are at Harvard, and we're all experiencing absolutely everything that we've talked about, and, and even more so. Um, are, we, are we losing? When you look at who our students, where do they come from? Fewer and fewer of them are coming from the United States. Um, and why is that? Well, we could say that people who come in from abroad are smarter than the Americans. I'm not sure that that's true. You know, I think that what's going on at, at MIT and HBS is that um, they found better ways to get their education, and they don't have to come to our schools to pay all of that money, you know? And, uh, and we're just in the middle of all of this. And uh, our faculty don't seem to be interested. So I, I think it, it works. We haven't yet applied it to the new president in America. But um, for almost everything else that we've seen, it, the principles that we've talked about are universally applicable. Thank you. Um, another uh, another question that's been asked in a few different forms is, um, is is a request for you to help us to understand where um, where kind of recharging a business model or tweaking a business model ends and a new and business model innovation or a truly new business model begins. Um, even as we're coming up towards the end of our hour, I wonder if there are some pointers, or if there's even an easy answer to that question. Well, one of the things that we've been really studying uh, recently is the, the seam, if you will, between the sustaining innovation phase and the efficiency innovation phase. So I think a, a really good marker, if we're trying to understand where are we on this journey, um, as, I, as we look at the innovations that are, are gaining impetus in the organization, that are getting funded, that, are, um, that, that we're enacting, um, are these revenue-oriented or profit-oriented? Are, are we still, in other words, expanding our share of this market, 
or ha are we now at the stage of shifting to um, how do we increase the profitability from the franchise that we've built? Which is a very natural um, and predictable stage. And it, right at that seam, you'll find what, what they call, what people have called twofers. So a sustaining innovation that improves our product position and saves money. And so it's very common. As you start to see more of those, you start to see that shift taking place. So that, that we've been studying uh, a, a little carefully because it's interesting to us to understand um, when that shift sets in. Does that help? Is that uh, it, it does. I mean, I, I think it's a it's a question that seems perhaps simpler on uh, in, in, in when written than it is that then there is a simple response. And but my, my gut is that seeing this question come up in a few different places is some of this just has to do with the language that you're using in the organization. And it, there's a there's an easy trap organizations can fall into on debating whether something is innovation or not. Um, and my sense is that people are looking for ways to talk about the process and to differentiate between um, both whether something is really just business as usual and then between the different types of, of, of innovation. So Derek, yes, I mean, I think the, the answer is very helpful. So two, other, two other things. First, uh, as, a, as a general proposition, uh, what it, it is much more common to start too late. So once the core business uh, reaches a place where it is now struggling to maintain its primacy, um, any opportunity that you've got to take resource now and redirect it to a new uh, line of business uh, becomes less and less likely. So um, point one, to your question of like when should we start, uh, y yesterday is typically the right answer. And then um, second, as, as you're um, looking for the problem, the problem that we're a problem we're studying right now is that all three types of these innovations that we talk to talk about at some level come to the same funding uh, uh, stage gate in the organization. Come to some, you know, management level executive committee where we're deciding what efficiency innovations in the businesses will we fund, what sustaining innovations, what market creating innovations do we want to fund. Almost always at that decision moment, as we suggested, efficiency innovations win over sustaining innovations, which win over market creating innovations. So as you look at your own resource allocation process, if you see a systematic bias away from uh, creating new businesses and toward uh, exploiting or extending the journey of existing businesses, that's a really important, um, that's a really important marker to call out because it's 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 right in the short term and very wrong in the long term. Yeah. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to need to I need to jump in um, as we are just on the very top of the hour. So first, I want to thank um, all of our um, participants today, um, our listeners today. You you delivered an overwhelming um, array of fantastic questions, and um, we apologize for getting to only a small number of them, but your questions were hugely valuable. Um, I want to remind um, everyone or let everyone know that you'll be receiving a survey in the next few days and would really appreciate hearing your feedback. Um, thank you again to our presenters, Clayton M. Christensen, Kim B. Clark, Professor of Business Administration at Harvard Business School, and Derek Van Beaver, Senior Lecturer at Harvard Business School and Director of the Forum for Growth and Innovation. Um, also, thanks again to our sponsor, Harvard Business School Executive Education. And a reminder, a recording of this program um, will be available in the next few days, and the presentation uh, slides should be available imminently. Thank you again for attending our program, and thank you again, Derek and Clay. It was terrific. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, thanks all. Thanks Good all of you, everybody.